have the feeling my whole message got shortened dramatically this morning. <laughs> I knew I had too much for the morning the way it was, but I got a feeling it got really shortened and condensed down to a specific point here. Before we left that last Sunday, <clears throat> if you'll remember, just to kind of get us up and rolling, uh, the Holy Spirit led us to invite a moving of the Spirit in the church and in the community and, and in wherever we have influence for. And he wants to take us into another season of moving in the Spirit or, that's the wrong way to say it, of him moving in us. And it, I know there's waves to this, and he's showing me some things about this, but we invited him to do that. That was kind of the big emphasis of that last Sunday. And uh, I told you I said there's some things we're not hearing, and we don't like to go on vacation and mix ministry with vacation. I've, I've always felt something's off with that. You either need to minister or you need to be on a break. Well, my, my wife, Mary, is, is doing a lot of uh, studying on the brain, and she says, I just discovered why that's necessary. And she's got all the, the actual medical terms, but most of our thinking and logical processing and everything takes place in the frontal cortex, right? And when we're in a day-to-day, -day, this is how we're living, and this is what we're solving, and this is what we're doing, most of the attention goes there. That's why when you read books of successful entrepreneurs or businessmen, uh, there's just one thing that I found out when I read their books of, okay, what, what did you do to get successful? They come up with one thing. All of them say the same thing over and over and over. They said, we take, you might call them vacations, we take vacations or breaks often. And we'll go two, three weeks at a time. That's what made our business successful. And I'm going, leave the company. That helps. That made no sense to me until you read their explanation of it. They said you get so caught up in the routine, the day-to-day -day business of running your family or taking care of your, your job or doing your housework or whatever it is, that you get so focused on that, you can't see the options that are available and the creative part of you gets shut down. Um, one, one man in particular, a uh, huge successful company, if I'd name it, you'd all recognize it. He said, I get my best business ideas in Europe. He says, my company will send me to Europe and pay all the expenses, and I'll stay there for a month. And he says, I'll come back with an idea that will renovate my company. He says, I've tried to stay here and just keep working it and just keep working. And he said, I can't, it doesn't come to me. He said, but if I will unhook from it all, he says, all of a sudden I begin seeing what I couldn't see before. Well, see, she explains that and we're, we're or what she studied, we're tied into the front, frontal lobes, the, the, the main problem-solving area, and that's what we're using, and that shuts down the imaginative part or the creative part of our brain, which is called... Do you remember? Okay. It's all right. There's not a name for it. But anyway, the two tend to not work in conjunction, it's either your creative part, your imagine, your, your, the creative part of our, our being comes out of our imagination. So that realm is either working really strong and the logical part is shut down or the logical part is working really strong and that part shut down. And I say all that to say, we just need to take a break. No, I'm not just... <laughs> Uh, I say all that to say we don't like to mix ministry with vacation or time off because I have found I might as well just stay here and work because it, it doesn't shift in my head. 
It, 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 I've known that for years. It just not, does not make the shift. And three or four days break will not make the shift. You have to back away from it long enough so that it shifts and you're out of the prefrontal lobes and you're more in a relaxed state of, I wonder, and your creative juices start flowing. But this vacation, we did both because there's some things we felt the Lord was, was asking us to, he was, he was trying to get through to us, and we weren't hearing. And there were some things we wanted to do for ministry's sake, and rather than buy a plane ticket or whatever and, and run there and do these things and come back and spend all the money that way, we thought, well, let's just go kind of the same direction and we'll hit them both, and we'll try to unplug some, and we'll try to get some answers on some. Like, for instance, here's, I'll give you the four main things ministry-wise we wanted to hit. I've been having a lot of questions about the basically the Ark Encounter or the Ark in Kentucky. Um, never been there. I have no clue what this thing is like. Uh, all kinds of theological questions, and it's like, well, I can't answer them. I've never seen it. So we said, well, let's go do that, and let's do the Creation Museum in Cincinnati, and that way I'm familiar with it, and I can at least answer questions. Don't worry, that wasn't the main thing we wanted to do, though. We visited an Elevation Church. Uh, that was on purpose because they seem to be doing a good job of the satellite churches, and I wanted to get in to see what are they doing and how does this feel like in their church. So we intentionally visited an Elevation Church in North Carolina, and uh, there was a revival that had broken out in 2016 in West Virginia, uh, basically among teens. Some of you probably remember hearing about it uh, near Williamson, West Virginia, just across the border from Kentucky. Um, and <clears throat> some awesome things happened there, and we wanted to go there after the fact, because it's done now, wanted to go there after the fact, see what's happening. We were able to meet with the pastor and talk with him and spend some time with him and so forth. Since we know the Lord is kind of pulling us a certain direction, we wanted to go there and get some firsthand information. And again, rather than just buying plane tickets, flying out there and sitting down with them for a couple hours and then flying home, we thought, well, let's just incorporate it all and, and put it together. And it seemed to work out okay. Um, so we did incorporate some ministry with, with free time. Uh, we don't like to do that because you don't always unhook the way you should. But we are feeling the Holy Spirit is, is wanting to position Word of Life and TBO for a strong move of Him, of His Spirit. Jesus is wanting this to happen. So... I'm going to give you the first piece of what he gave me, and we'll save the rest for next Sunday. To do that, we have to ever get everybody on the same page. Um, it's just tough. Remember I said that last Sunday before we left, uh, move of the Spirit is dependent as much on the leadership as it is on the people, and it's as dependent as much on the people as it is on the leadership. You, you kind of all got to be in the boat together. So I'm going to be describing that as we go on, starting next Sunday and so forth, and I'll give you a, an idea where we're going towards, and maybe I should, let me just, I brought them, but I didn't expect to start speaking right away, so let me walk over here and grab them. Uh, down the road here a few weeks, we are going to go back and revisit, and it's going to be coming out of this booklet, this was in 2010 in the Open Heavens uh, meetings. We looked at seeking the glory, looking at the glory. We're going to go back to looking at the glory and what that is all about because I'll just say it this way. If we can posture, or I got something else to say about this. Better hold on to it so don't forget. If we can posture ourselves correctly, to see the glory, everything else breaks loose. You say, why would we be so interested in the glory? Because it is what man fell from. 
and it's what God wants to restore us back to. Well, in Jesus, we're already restored. Well, if this is what it looks like to be in the glory of God in the church in America, I ain't buying it. There's, there's more to it than this. So I'll get in and I'll explain all that, but we will be going through certain aspects of this. This is online for free. If you want to get it there and download it to your device, that's fine. If you want a hard copy like this, you, we're going to have a sign-up sheet. We don't have it this Sunday. We'll probably have it next Sunday. And uh, they're like five bucks a piece. And we'll need to know who wants them and who doesn't so we can get them made up. Um, so we will be going into that basically for the purpose of studying the glory again. And if you're wondering why we call it Open Heavens, this booklet from 2009 is where we studied Open Heavens and what the Scripture says about Open Heavens and how to secure an Open Heaven and so forth. And <clears throat> we're going to, if, if you want that and you want to find out what Open Heavens is all about, uh, you can feel free to order one of those too. That's from 2009. This is the main one we're going to be focusing on. So that's where we're going is to move into talking about the glory. Well, while we were gone, the Holy Spirit very clearly told me something, and that's what I'm going to just key on a little bit here this morning. I will speak on it some. Mary will speak on it some before we actually start really looking at the glory. He said, before you start talking about the glory so that I can be free to manifest, he says, you need to talk about fear. And I'm going, fear? What in the world? Why fear? And the only thing he said to me is he said, my people, by and large, and I'm talking American. I don't know what the world's like because I don't travel the world. But I'm talking America. He says, my people, by and large, are motivated by fear. And he says, you will not get a good manifestation or move of the spirit coupled with the motivation of fear. So you've got to deal with fear. I thought, well, I can do that. That's an interesting approach to revival, which is another word for you know, moving in the spirit or outpouring of the spirit. We'll talk about them as I was going to do it today, but it'll probably be next Sunday or the Sunday after. Um, interesting approach, but yeah, we'll do that, and then we can move into talking about the glory and so forth. So when I woke up this morning, the Holy Spirit asked me a question, because I keep saying, what is the deal with the fear thing? I, I'm, not, I'm not putting the pieces together on fear and revival. I'm not seeing this as clearly as I should, or fear and the outpouring of the Spirit. It, it, what is the deal with I keep asking him that. So I woke up this morning, and first thing he asked me a question. And this is kind of what we'll focus on this morning and leave the rest of the message for next week. He asked me this question. He said, why does physical prosperity and blessing tend to cause spiritual complacency and lethargy? So I'm going to say it again. We'll need to go to Deuteronomy 8. I will read a few scriptures here. Why does physical prosperity... And blessings. So in other words, we're prospered physically. We're blessed in the physical realm, material realm. Why does that tend to cause spiritual complacency and lethargy? Well, that's a good question. And whenever the Holy Spirit asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know. I've said that over and over. I'll just keep saying it. He didn't ask me that question to get my opinion because he don't have a clue. He knows. I don't know. And he's being very gracious on leading me into it. The Holy Spirit will lead us and teach us more things by questions than any other thing. It, it's, that's my experience. He won't make a bunch of big statements to you. He'll ask questions, and he'll lead you. He leads us, he, and... He ran three scriptures through my mind as soon as he asked me that question. He said, for example, Deuteronomy 8. Bring that up if you would, please. This was when the children of Israel were getting ready to go in the promised land. 
He said, be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you in all the ways in the wilderness 40 years, humble you and test you in order that to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, which right there he was, he was teaching them faith and trust and reliance on him to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So if God said it, he's going to perform it. He's going to take care of it. You need to trust me and need to learn to have some faith. So he's teaching them some things there. Next verse. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. For 40 years, they wore the same shoes and same clothes and never wore out. Why? Because God said, I'll take care of you. You need to learn to trust me and believe that. Okay, next verse. No, there it is. Know then in your, I was going to say, don't switch again. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Huh, we heard that about a few weeks back, something about that. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. Next verse. For the land your God, your, the Lord your God is bringing you into is a good land, a land with brooks and streams and deep springs gushing out in the valleys and the hills a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God because, see, that's what material, physical prosperity and blessing produces in us in this fallen nature condition. We get comfortable and we forget who gave it to us. And we get sloppy and lazy spiritually. He says, don't forget, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I'm giving you this day, Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, see, they're going to do great in the material, physical realm. And when your herds and your flocks grow large and your silver and your gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Luke 12, if you'd go there with me. Um, back to the Holy Spirit's question. Why does physical prosperity and blessing, like we just read about the Israelites, tend to cause spiritual complacency and lethargy? It doesn't have to produce that spiritual lethargy and complacency in us, but it really seems to do it in a lot of people. And everybody's tempted with it. Why? Luke chapter 12, verse 18. Let's read this. Second example he gave me. Then he said, this is what I'll, what I'll do. I will tear, so this is, a, this is the man who became wealthy. He got good crops. He had a good season. And all of a sudden, materially, he's blessed and he's, he's prospering. He says, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. So here you've got a person who's been blessed financially and he's set and he feels really good about it and he becomes or he is found in a state of being very poor towards God, very lethargic, very complacent. One more verse, uh, Revelation chapter 3. These are the three he gave me. So now the interesting part here is God wants to, for the furtherance of the gospel's sake, God needs to prosper his people financially. The kicker to it is, if we don't mature enough to the point we can handle the prosperity, he's actually giving us something that will damage us. Because we'll spiritually get lazy because 
now, well, we must be doing something right. Look at how great we're doing. And we back off. Why do we do that was his question. Revelation 3, last example, verse number 14, the Laodicean church. So we know, you know, it happened way back thousands of years ago, happened in Jesus' time. Now this is talking our time. The angel of the church in Laodicea, right? These are the words of Jesus, in other words. Next verse. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. So that's not a good spiritual condition. Here was their opinion of themselves. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Because they had acquired wealth, didn't need a thing, they were rich, they became sloppy, complacent, lazy Christians. Lukewarm. Back to his question. Why does physical prosperity and blessing tend to cause that? Spiritual complacency and lethargy. And again, I emphasize it doesn't have to, but it tends to do it. You find it all through Scripture. So I'm laying in bed going, that's a good question. I don't know if I know the answer to that. And he said this. He said, because the average Christian is not motivated by faith, but by fear. So now we're back to what he told me when we were on our trip. He said, the average Christian is motivated by fear. So now I'm going, okay, so the average Christian is motivated by fear, not faith. That's what causes spiritual lethargy or complacency when we start prospering get physical abundance, physical health, emotionally we're feeling good, whatever. Why would that be? So I asked Mary. Because I'm rolling this around. And I've got an idea, but I want to throw it off of her. I said, i got a question for you. Why do you think physical abundance, physical health, emotional rest, life is good. We're doing good. Why would that cause a person to tend towards lethargy? or laziness, or complacency spiritually. I said, what do those things, physical abundance, you know, we've got money, we've got a house, we've got enough food to eat, we've got our health insurance, we've got our health, we're doing pretty good, uh, I'm at peace. What do those things produce in us? She said, they make you feel safe. Comfort. You're relaxed, you're at peace, you're, you feel safe, you feel secure. Remove some of them from people, all of a sudden they're motivated to seek God. Why are they seeking God? They're afraid. They're not seeking out of faith. They're seeking out of fear. Because when they had what they needed, they weren't seeking. They felt secure and safe, so why should I, you know, let's not make a big deal out of this. Life's going well for us. Lose your job, and now you could lose your house. All of a sudden, we're a church, man, and we're asking for prayer, and we're praying, and dear Jesus, somebody's got to do something here. You take away all the fluff at the top, do you know what you find at the bottom? They're afraid. So we're coming to God in fear, asking him to do something in our life. And he does very little, and then we get frustrated with God. Well, I needed you. Where were you when I needed you? And he's kind of looking at us and saying, where were you when I had blessed you? You were doing good. I had blessed you, and you forgot about me. You got lazy. Well, you just didn't read your Bible as much as you should. Remember when you're, when you're really pursuing something because you're afraid? The doctor gave you bad news? All of a sudden, reading your Bible and praying becomes important. But when you're feeling really good, I can skip a few days, it's all good. You're forgetting about God. You're getting lazy spiritually. When we have the blessings of God, and it's because of the fallen nature, it's the old sin thing, we tend to grow more lazy spiritually remove some of those blessings 
all of a sudden we're motivated, but we're motivated by the wrong thing. We're motivated by fear. Simple definition of fear. <gasps> See, it always hits the emotions. Fear gives you that, <gasps> that emotional adrenaline burst. They said, what? <gasps> and the emotions are in. Fear is an emotional thing. It ties into logic, but it's an emotional thing. Fear is, what if something bad happens? What if this goes wrong? What if people find out? What? See, it's the negative slant of, oh my goodness, this could really go bad. We got to go get prayer. You really need to deal with your fear before prayer is going to do anything because God's not motivated by fear. He's motivated by faith. Now all of a sudden I'm going, oh, I think I'm beginning to see this. The reason you're saying, before you go talking about the glory and all these wonderful things God can do for us by faith, Let's get the motivation in the body switch from fear to faith. Because fear is when we're trying to escape something. Faith is when we're trying to lay hold of something. Well, I'm trying to lay hold of something, a new job, because we could lose our house. No, that's, that's, not, that's fear. Something bad could happen. We could lose our house. Are you praying the same way now as you did when you had the good job and the house payment was being made? Well, no. There's your problem. What changed? So our spiritual life changes on the basis of circumstance? Well, circumstances changed. So now your whole spiritual life changed because of circumstance? That's the exact thing God does not want to happen in us. We should be the same approach to God, the same approach to life. Like Paul says, I know how to abound, I know how to be abased. And I know how to walk this thing out. He says it this way in the King James, and I know how to be content in whichever state I'm in. I know how to walk this thing out and stay consistent either way. Fear motivates us to escape something. And we approach God on that basis. God, they said, I've got this disease, and we got to get the elders to lay hands on me and anoint me with oil because something bad could happen. So, oh, please, God, I'm believing you. No, you're freaked out. You're not believing anything except your fear. You're not coming in faith saying, I know what his word says. I know what the atonement did for me. I know what his sacrifice paid for. I am coming to claim some of the property that is owed me. I will receive my healing for this now, and I'm standing on it. We're not coming that That's faith. We're coming of, oh, what if they're right? What if they're right? Oh, this is going to mess it up. We had plans, and I was going to retire, and now I could be sick. And Oh, God, please, 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 please fear and the sad part is those people tend to get sick or get worse because they're not coming to faith they're coming to, they're motivated by fear so i didn't see this aspect of it but we talked about a bunch of things on the trip of well where do we see christians motivated by fear in their everyday life but it was amazing when you stop and think about it, it's like yeah, there's a lot of people who are living their life by fear. I'll just give you two real simple examples. If a piece of food drops on the floor, will you pick it up and eat it? Why? germs you're afraid you're going to get something you made that decision on the basis of fear <laughs> 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 
Now, granted, if it fell into the gutter in the barn, I'd probably leave it alone, too. <laughs> that, ba that decision is not made on the basis of faith. That decision is made on the basis of fear, which all it's saying is there's a lot of decisions in your life you're deciding from fear, not faith. I've had people tell me, we need to have hand sanitizer stations in the foyer. Why? Well, you're shaking hands with all these people, and you never know what you could catch. You know what that's called? Fear. I'm just rattling around what's been rattling in me over the last couple of weeks and what he said to me this morning. Why? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd never eat anything without having put hand sanitizer on my hands first. Why? Because God told you to live that way? Or your fear is telling you to live that way? Can be trained. Trained fear. <laughs> So what happens is fear becomes the foundational attitude and approach of how we live our Christian lives. And here is the kicker. If life smooths out and gets good and we've got enough finances and we've got our health and we've got food and the kids aren't acting out too much and things are calmed down, We have nothing to be afraid of. So our craving and pursuit of God drops. Because our craving and pursuit for God is not really based on faith where he said, go take that mountain and get it, subdue it, rule it, change it. Our, our pursuit of God is not based on moving forward Obtaining those things that are not, start by calling them as though they are, and go after it and rule it, conquer it. We're not pursuing God on that basis. We're pursuing God on the basis of running from things. And if we've got nothing to run from and we feel pretty safe and secure, I don't see why we have to get all radical about this God thing. But let somebody run a red light, run into your, into your car, and your wife and your child's in the hospital, and there could be serious repercussions. We need prayer. We're just believing God. We need people in here. We need them in here now. Who are you again? I haven't seen you in church for a few months. Well, we're alive. Is my church home. And we need your help right now. Yeah, because when things were going good, you weren't pursuing God. You got lazy, you got lethargic, and you forgot about where could he possibly want us to go and actually make a difference. I'm satisfied because our life is not built on faith taking hold of something and pulling it in. Our life is built on fear, which means if nothing's chasing me, I'm good. Relax. And then we come to God and say, God, pour out your spirit on us. For what? Well, to keep my life good so I don't have to be afraid of anything. No, see, the outpouring of the spirit is given to move us forward and take new ground. Yeah, that's right. Our life being good so we don't have to live in fear, that was bought in covenant for us. It's already given to us. It's ours by inheritance and promise. So to say, well, we need to move with the Spirit so that we don't have to be afraid of anything, so we can be safe and secure and have a nice congregation. That's already been bought and paid for. We just need to take our stand on it and claim it and walk in it. What he wants us to do is take new ground. That's what an outpouring of the Spirit is for. You don't take new ground when you're fearful people. Why? Because something could go wrong. 
Something bad could happen. We wish we'd never done this. That's all fear speaking. You know, it's good now. There's, there's nothing going on. I mean, it's, there's nothing happening. It's calm. It's peaceful. That's the problem. It's too calm and peaceful. There's nothing going on. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, let's kick this up a notch. Let's take some new ground. Let's invade some enemy territory and get some harvest. Oh, pastor, I don't know. Fear. This could, this could go bad. Yeah, it could. But who are we believing, God or... Which God are we believing, I should say? We're believing something. It's which God. Are we believing the God who says, take this step. We're going to walk forward and we're going to do some things. Okay, you said it. We're going to do it. Or we believe in this God who says, if you take that step, something bad could happen. You know what happened to, and then there's always a story. And it's never a positive one. <laughs> it's always a negative one. So I'll go back to the first thing I said. We feel the Lord is posturing or positioning Word of Life and TBO for a strong move of the Spirit. But what are we really pursuing? To begin with, the first thing He wants us to pursue is freedom from our fear. Freedom from being motivated by fear. Do you know why? I'll just give you a couple of, you know, I gave you some already, but let me give you one when the Spirit of God starts moving. Do you know why people can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and never speak in tongues? They're afraid. Well, how do I know it's not the devil talking out of me? See, that's fear talking. The reason you know that is because God's word says it won't be. You're either going to take that by faith or you're going to sit there paralyzed in fear. The reason people don't come to the front and get prayed for is because of fear. Well, what would my wife think? What would my friends think so you're afraid and you're making the decision on that basis the reason we don't enter into worship well it just makes me feel kind of really strange and uncomfortable to you know lift hands and talk louder than that I, I just don't want to look stupid you know what that is? Fear. Fear. So here we have, and all of us have our issues. Here we have God's people living lives motivated by fear, asking for a move of the Spirit. So he'll take us up on our request. But the first thing that happens when you say, God, take us someplace, he will. He'll say, okay, follow me. And we're standing here going, that, that could go bad. I mean, I, I want you to move by your spirit, but I don't really want you to interrupt my life. I don't want you to do anything that could upset the apple cart, because if that, that could go bad. I mean, if I take that first step, who knows what you're going to ask next? And now I'm not there anymore, and I'm not there anymore. And see, that's all fear talking. We don't trust them. So how in the world can he take us into a move of his spirit when we make our basic decisions on the basis of fear? I heard one person say, well, I'm never going to come to the front and get prayed for because I ain't going to let myself get knocked down like some of the people. I said, why? Well, I don't know what that is, and that scares me. Well, at least they owned it. They said, I'm afraid. So if I could show you this in the Word, that this is what's happening and this is what God is doing, would you be okay with it then? Because see, perfect love casts out all fear. Yeah. Right. We interpret that as emotional warm fuzziness. 
God's going to come and make us feel emotionally warm and fuzzy and we won't be afraid anymore. That's not. Perfect love will show you you. What did James say? We look into a mirror to see ourselves. Perfect love shows us us like we're looking in a mirror. And then perfect love takes what we see and says, we can fix that. And hugs are nice, but hugs don't fix a lot. They can calm your nerves. They can make you feel accepted. They can calm you down a little bit. But they don't necessarily fix the fear. The fear is a core belief issue. And until we really understand how much he loves us, what he said, what his promises are, what this thing is, that core belief issue won't be dealt with. And the thing is, I can't explain a lot of that to you. I can give you information, but the Holy Spirit has to get it from here to here to deal with the fear. Yeah. 